Okay, everybody got some coffee, right? Otherwise, you're going to fall asleep. Um, I'll try to make it rather uh, no math examples, try to pick up some fun examples so that it can keep you up. I also know that I'm standing between you and lunch. <laughs> so there are a lot of slides here. We don't have to go through all of them, but I wanted you to have the slides so you know there's a huge amount of application for powder diffraction, right? Uh, we'll, we'll try to go through it, most of them. Okay, so basically what we're trying to do with crystallography or diffraction is we're trying to figure out where the atoms are. We're not really trying to figure out if they're moving or vibrating, although sometimes we have to know what they're doing because that's what's important. You might want to do some spectroscopy afterwards, but when you're trying to figure out where the atoms are, you need a radiation that has the similar wavelength as the interatomic distances, right? So we have all these types of structure, and the wavelengths go from anywhere from 0.1 to above 10 angstrom. So we choose our wavelength based on what we're trying to do. So what I'm going to talk about is powder diffraction and crystallography, which means we are in this type of wavelength range, right? Because our interatomic distances are usually about an angstrom. And so x-rays have wavelength that is accessible for this, as does neutrons. Now, how do you go from, uh, diffractionists tend to think about wavelengths because Bragg's law, you've heard about that a couple of times, I'm sure. Uh, but, you know, spectroscopists like to think about in energy, so you need to do this conversion. Uh, my graduate student uh, school supervisor used to say, this is one thing you should be able to do in your dreams, okay? So make sure you know these conversion factors because it will come in handy. So source, of course, lab diffractometers. Mo uh, some of you who do this have a lab diffractometer, and then for... Uh, X-rays, you can go to a synchrotron, which where you spent last week, I believe, at APS. For neutrons, we have reactors and spallation source, and both have instruments that allow you to do powder diffraction. So I'm going to talk about phase identification and quantitative phase analysis, structure and transport, neutron powder diffraction. You know, why do neutrons? You have a lab diffractometer. Uh, you can go to synchrotrons, but there are some problems for which neutrons come in handy. And sometimes life is not simple and you have to use both. Uh, time resolved studies are becoming more and more important. So in situ, those are uh, things I think the future holds is essentially in operando. You want to look at your materials while you, it's operating in a certain condition. And now this one, I want to make sure that people understand that refinement and structure solution are two different things. Okay, refinement means you more or less have an idea what your structure is. You're tweaking it to fit to your data. Structure solution means you have no idea what the structure is. And that's a far more complex thing to do. I will touch a little bit on structure solution, but I won't be able to go into depth because that's a whole new lecture. But I've given you some resources that if you're interested in structure solution, hopefully you can look those up. And, you know, people are even using powder diffraction for doing protein work. So those of you in the audience who are more interested in protein crystallography might learn something new, that there are some ways to use powder diffraction to study your materials. So the biggest use, commercial use of powder diffraction, these slides came from one of my colleagues, uh, the first ones at least, uh, Jim Kedok, who has a nice lab diffractometer, and he's retired. He worked in the petrochemical industry for a lifetime. And now he basically says, I can look at anything I want, right? Yeah, I don't have a job, no one pays me. Oh, well, he's affiliated with the university. But not a lot of people put in peanut butter on the x-ray diffractometer to see what, that, what happens. But this is really a very cool technique to do phase identification. What is in your sample? And how much of what is in your sample? So this is used by the cement folks as their primary tool. I, in fact, went to a meeting a couple of weeks ago where they were showing there's a whole room 
full of lab diffractometer that are set up to do quantitative phase analysis to see if the cement that's coming out of the factory is actually what it should be. And there's a little robot that goes around, puts the sample in, and it does this automatically. But here, of course, you put in peanut butter, you see this whopping big background. Of course, most of the stuff that's in your peanut butter is not crystalline. But surprisingly, look how much of it is. Because you have sugar, you have salt, all of these things are crystalline, so it gives you a peak. So now if you're Jim, you can figure out what these things are. Actually, you can do it too. So he looked at four different uh, peanut butters and did a quantitative phase analysis, okay? So what are we looking for? We're looking for sugar, we're looking for salt. Apparently there's something called dolomite in these things too. Surprised me. Uh, and there's some fat as well, okay? Notice how if you have a, a buy a reduced fat GIF, it has more fat than <laughs> what you'd expect. So of course, you know, this is the crystalline content, not the amorphous content. So uh, some of this fat might actually be in an amorphous state. That might be what they're measuring. But it's kind of a fun exercise, but also shows you the power of what you can do. If you put in a sample, you can figure out if I have sugar, how much sugar do I have? You know, these are, you know, you're buying reduced fat, creamy, you're buying low sugar. It turns out if you have, if, it, if it's low fat, generally it tends to have more sugar in it, okay? So because the taste wants something, right? So again, the, the reduced fat ones have a bit higher sugar than the standard one. Okay, now if you're an archeologist, you might want to be digging up things from the ground and wanting to see what those people were using for, let's say, makeup versus ritual coloring, right? So this is something, this is a long time ago when I was a graduate student. Uh, the, the paper came out later. Uh, there was an archeologist who sent us some pigments. And basically what they were trying to figure out, what is it that they use for actual makeup versus ritual makeup, which was after the body was buried. Uh, this came from this area. If you read your history, which I didn't know about Tunisian history, but I looked them up, they, were, they had lots of wars with uh, the Greeks and the other invaders. And so they were trying to separate out what was from the Greek period versus Roman period versus Carthaginian period, which was a different one. So this was the site. And we got samples like this. But n remember, when samples come from the field, they never look perfect like the ones that you make at home, OK? So we have a lot of difference still, but we still could identify what's in them. So not a surprise that there is a lot of sand, that they were dug out from sand. And there is mercury, OK? So mercury was being used as a pigment, which is, you know, now we know that that's not good for you. but Clearly, they didn't. Uh, mercury sulfide was one of the things that was found in the ritual makeups, so the stuff that came out of the bodies. Um, they also found these pigments, which had a lot of more background, which indicates that they probably came from organic sources. So it's pigments from flowers or whatever they were mixing up. And they have different chemicals, which is primarily organic source, right? So they actually make pigments not only from the, the rocks that had color, but they also made pigments from natural sources like uh, plant life and flowers, etc. So that allows you to kind of build a picture of what this civilization looked like. So again, we, can, we could do the quantitative phase analysis and identify what was in these samples. So how do you do that? Well, I said fingerprinting, right? So fingerprinting is just like you. The only way I can find you from a database if I have fingerprinted you before, right? So essentially everybody who finds a new structure submits it to a database. So we have this large database where now you can look for the same thing that you have measured in your lab. So these are various different, this is the primary source of powder diffraction file. It's maintained by ICDD. Now this is old. They, add these structures uh, every year. And so here are some other uh, sources where you can get this from. These are not, unfortunately, free. Uh, you do have to have subscription to these databases. 
So now, um, if you're a physicist like me, most of the time what we're interested about structures is because we have some transport properties that are very cool and we want to understand why, right? So when I was a PhD student, I was working on fullerenes. Now fullerenes are these things called uh, most popularly known as buckyballs. Uh, it has a structure like a soccer ball. Uh, in 1985, they were uh, discovered. And in 1990, people figured out how to make them in larger quantities because original discovery was from extraterrestrial in space. You saw a signature of a different type of carbon. And in 1991, soon after people were able to make it, they realized you could dope it with these alkali metals and make it into a superconductor. Now, superconductors are cool, right? And they had a uh, reasonably decent um, TC, only used to be. When we were working on these, the iron nictite superconductors were not discovered yet. So high TCs were around, but these had nice spherical structures, which physicists like, because you can model them very well. So what is it doing? Essentially, it has 60 electrons, right? And you can calculate the band structure and find that the lowest unoccupied mole molecular orbital can take up to six electrons, which is where you're doping, right? You're putting in alkali atoms that can donate these up to six electrons. And you, know, you can find the bond distances, et cetera, all of this, so you start playing with alkali atoms, it forms a face-centered cubic lattice. If there is no alkali, then you start stretching it out. You can put all, there is no fives, but you can do one, three, four, and six alkali. And the structure changes, and the properties are drastically different, right? So these electrons do make a difference. This one, for example, makes these nice polymer chains. And this one is the superconductor. Okay, so it's a half-filled band. From band theory, we expect it to be metallic, so it's all good. Uh, this one uh, can't keep the cubic structure anymore and turns tetragonal. In the six, um, it's a body-centered, so it goes from face-centered to body-centered. So this is the, in the interest. So the idea behind it, which was very nicely worked out, is if you increase the lattice parameter, if you stretch it out by changing, you know, rubidium is smaller than cesium, Sodium is smaller than rubidium, so you can actually change, chemically dope, and change the lattice parameter that way. If you do that, you can bring up your BCS theory, and it fits beautifully, right? The TC changes as a function of lattice parameter because of the fact that the density of states is changing. Now, all of this was really nicely done. So, the next idea that some guy has had, and I actually remembered that day very specifically, there was a science article that came out, and my supervisor rushed into my office, like, have you seen this? I said, seen what? It's like they've doped it, not chemically, but with a device. So if I make a field effect transistor, I can now do hole doping rather than electron doping. Now by doing that, they have a new tuning parameter, and now it's a device, it's not, you're not putting you're not doing a synthesis, but you're, you have a tuning, which all of us like, right? You can tune the temperature. Uh, and not only that, they can now put in spacers to make the lattice parameter larger, like chloroform, bromoform, and get TCs like 80 Kelvin. Now, 80 Kelvin is, there is a thing, right? It's above liquid nitrogen. If you can make a superconducting device at these temperatures, this was the hottest thing that was going on at that time. So obviously, us being working on fullerenes, on structures, etc., we got a hold of this uh, sample from Germany, and we pretty much worked all night. It was like the last three days of NSLS operation that cycle, and we said, okay, fine, what is the structure doing at those temperatures? You can't assume that it's doing the same thing at room temperature, right? So we cooled it down, Turns out it is doing something. It's going from hexagonal to monoclinic to triclinic. So things are changing as you're going through those transition temperatures. So here's our fit. It, it, this is at room temperature. It is the same interatomic distances they were it, using to explain why this phenomena happens. However, all of a sudden my lattice parameters have all changed at 170 Kelvin. 
And it's getting even worse because it's turning into a triclinic lattice. So we start scratching our heads. The whole assumption is the interatomic distances, the distance between two balls is what you're changing is why it's giving you a higher TC. That is not true when you look at the structure because it's no longer a hexagonal lattice. So if you assume it's a hexagonal lattice and calculate those distances, that's not correct. So we, we did all of the structural work and essentially said, okay, strong in, uh, is not just an effect of simple lattice exp expansion. This is, you cannot explain it just the, the same thing that we were doing with the chemical doping. So we wrote up a paper which said evidence against lattice expansion as the sole explanation for TC increase in chloroform and bromoformin doped C60. This was submitted to science. Science liked the paper but did not like the title because they had published all his work saying this is how, how it works and this is the explanation for it. So we had to change the title. Structure of heliform intercalated C60 and its influence on superconductive properties. Not negative, right? So this is what started happening uh, when I was about to graduate. I, I got invited to a meeting to talk about these structural effects. And the person who was working on this from AT&T Bell Labs, Sean, was the first speaker and he didn't show up at this meeting. Everybody's going, what's going on? Apparently there were journalists in front of his house because it came out that when they started looking at his data very, very carefully, two entirely different samples had the same noise, which information theory tells us is not possible, okay? So they start, people started, because one of the things that the lesson learned from this exercise is when you find something exciting, like when the iron superconductors came about, right? Everybody in their labs tried to make it and they could reproduce their results. This is an important factor in science. When you do something in your lab, if I do the same thing in my lab, I should be able to do it. The problem with this study was no one could reproduce their answers. And not only that, they were saying we can make better FETs than you can. That's why you can't make it. You know, th th this, this only works for about a year. After that, people start getting suspicious. So essentially, pioneer physics studies under suspicion, a sudden host of questions on Bell Lab breakthroughs. In 2001, he was listed as an author on an average of one research paper every eight days. Okay. I wish I could do this. Not possible, uh, unless you're supervising like 50 people. October 31 in 2002, science withdrew eight papers. Uh, December, there were a lot of more other papers, Nature, Physical Review Letters, they were all withdrawing his papers because he had made all of this up. So, lessons learned. Our paper is still correct. It's a nice powder diffraction structure work. It got published in science. It would have never gotten published in science had it not been for all that else that was going on. It probably would have ended up in powder diffraction. We probably wouldn't even have looked at it honestly speaking, but you know, science is very important and ethics is very important. If you do a correct science, I can still defend what I did because if I went and collected that sample again with my diffractometer, I would still get the same answer, right? So high impact journals are fine, but make sure you're doing, you're being honest with your data collection, data analysis, and publication and keep good records. One of the things that the first thing that people did when they were under suspicion is try to find their lab books, try to find their raw data, try to find the computer that was collected on, okay? None of which was available. Okay, moving on. Why neutrons? So uh, I hope this is a good lesson for you because things can get very exciting. And you can find out, well, maybe it wasn't so exciting after all. Why neutrons? Neutrons are exciting. That's what I've been doing for the last decade. I switched over from synchrotrons, uh, which is what I did uh, PhD, most of my PhD work with, and then I took a postdoc at Argonne National Lab at a facility that is no longer there. Neutrons have this wonderful thing that 
it doesn't scatter off of the electron cloud. It scatters off of the nucleus, right? Which means a periodic table for most chemists looks like this because the atom number Z increases, your scattering power increases. Our periodic table looks like this, okay? Which means we have a different contrast. So we can often detect light atoms even in the presence of heavier atoms. Let's say if you're looking at tungsten oxide, you're going to see mostly the tungsten. If you put it in an X-ray beam, we can see the oxygen just as well. If they're sitting next to each other, right? You have only one electron difference if they're sitting next to each other on the periodic table. And let's say you like to play with transition metals, which a lot of people do. Then it's very hard to distinguish when you're doping, so which we can sometimes do. Not always, but most of the time we can actually do that. Because you see there's a huge variation between atoms that are sitting next to each other. Of course, magnetic moment. This is one of the reasons why Scholl and um, Brockhaus were given the Nobel Prize, that they proved that you can see the magnetic structure in a crystalline material using neutrons, which is not possible to do with x-rays because, again, you're interacting with the now your moment is interacting with the electron cloud and giving you the information about the spins. So this is very unique, so we do a lot of magnetic structures. And finally, neutrons go through pretty much everything. So in situ studies have been around for neutrons for a very long time, longer than x-rays. X-rays, the high energy x-rays are a new thing. In fact, when we were starting out, the high energy x-rays were like the new, new kid in town Whoa, we can go, go through all these materials because I can make an insertion device in a synchrotron that gives me oodles of x-rays. But neutrons have always been a pioneer in doing in situ uh, work. So this, these two things I really would like all of you to learn because this is the thing that I fight with for most of my users, is you need to look at what their scattering lengths are because you can't assume you it has nothing to do with Z, so your periodic table is not sufficient. So make sure you have these two links uh, bookmarked if you're going to do neutron work, and that's irrespective of whether you're doing diffraction or elastic spectroscopy. You click on one of these things and it gives you a table, okay, which shows you the coherent scattering length. It shows it for all the isotopes as well. So let's say you're somebody who's interested in battery work and you're playing with lithium. Natural lithium has this kind of large absorption cross-section. Lithium-6 has huge absorption cross-section. This might be a problem because you're not going to get through much of the material. However, lithium-7 has none. So that already tells you natural lithium is primarily lithium-7 with a little bit of lithium-6, okay? If you find an atom that you're interested in, this shows a large number, the next thing you need to do is do an absorption calculation how much of my neutrons will get absorbed by this element being in my sample. So for example, if you have cadmium or gadolinium, chances are neutron diffraction may not work, okay? What this calculation allows you to do is see one over E penetration depth. What is one over E penetration depth? See, after that length, six, more than 60% of your neutrons have been absorbed, okay? So I picked a bad, bad player here. In fact, that's sort of what I'm measuring right now at my beam line. It's instead of lithium, it's strontium. Iridium is another bad player, okay? So you put it in, you put in the mass and the density, et cetera. There's a bigger table there. I'm not showing all of it. But what it spits out when you do the calculate is this, which is now showing you at 0.35 centimeters, 60% of your neutron is absorbed, right? Which means if you put it in a 10 millimeter can, you are not going to see a large fraction of your sample. So how, what can size you use, what sample holder you use, is determined by that. So make sure you do this calculation. We have lots of sample environments. We can do cold, we can do hot, we can do magnetic field. There's a, and, and this is not an exhaustive list. It's just essentially, this is something we develop all the time. And here are more if you're in, interested in engineering diffraction, we can put in a load frame and look at it. We, we have collimators that cuts out things that you don't want to see, like the background and stuff. So there's a plenty of sample environment available. And if it's not available, contact your instrument scientists and see, can we do this? Maybe we can come up with something. Detectors. 
Again, I'm not going to go through a whole lot of this, but I just kind of wanted to touch, it, touch on it. Most of our instruments use helium tubes. Some of our instruments also use, uh, which is actually the ones that we use on PowerJet, is scintillator detectors, which has a scintillation materials and wavelength shifting fibers. This is what it looks like inside. These technologies came from the high energy physics community. Okay, so first one. I said you can see light elements in the presence of heavy elements. There is not, nothing lighter than hydrogen, right? A lot of people want to know what the hydrogen is doing or what water is doing. So if you're a mineralogist, this is a structure of hemimorphite, which has one water for every zinc silicate of this formula. So the interest is how, what is the water doing? What is the phase transitions, et cetera? So we did this work with single crystal on topaz. And we, topaz did, doesn't currently have the ability to go down to very, very low temperature. It's going to happen soon. But so Christina brought me this sample and said, can we measure it at 10K and look at it you know, with the, the, all the phase transitions that we have? I said, sure. But you know, it has water, powder diffraction offering Often we, we are very worried about hydrogen. We tell people to deuterate their material because hydrogen is another one. If you went to that NIST site and clicked on hydrogen, it'll show you it has a huge incoherent scattering, right? It has 80 barns of incoherent scattering. So that is great for spectroscopy, for diffraction, that gives us a huge background. The background is wavelength dependent as well, so it looks like this. You see this with strange shape in the background? That comes from the fact that I have hydrogen in it. However, turns out if you have very high symmetry, hydrogen and water, et cetera, we can actually do this. So this is a fit with the, what was known from x-rays because you don't know where the hydrogen is. And look how horrible that fit is, right? I can't really fit these peaks very well. Just put in the hydrogen and this is what the fit looks like. So neutrons can see hydrogen. If you, do, if you have a single crystal, you don't even have to worry about how many hydrogen. It can actually do a pretty large number of hydrogen. For powder, we have to be a little bit more careful. But we can do a Fourier difference map. If I didn't know where the hydrogen was, I just put in the x-ray structure and see the difference map in the density. I can actually see, let's see, this is water, right? Not only that, this is water at 110 Kelvin. It's not quite localized. Sometimes you do have to worry about things moving, I told you, right? At 10 Kelvin, however, it's nicely localized because motions stop when you cool it that much. Not only can we see the, or the water, we can also see in certain places it's OH, okay? So this is beautiful. You could not do this with x-rays. Okay, two, two atoms next to each other in x-ray does not show it very well. So here is a battery. I do a lot of battery work. Nickel and manganese. This is a spinel structure that's being considered for a high voltage cathode. Now these things, depending on how you make them, whether you slow cool them or quench them or do it at 900, fire at 900 versus 700, this thing can order, okay? Which means that it's no, it will give you some additional reflections because the space group changes. Now nickel has a, Preferred site, manganese has a preferred site. 11 BM and uh, Paugen has a partner proposal because we do the same thing, one with x-rays, one with neutron. So we work together. This is a data set that was collected on two samples, one ordered and one not ordered at 11 BM and you see there's, they are identical, okay? Look at the neutron data. You see these bumps? These are real. This is essentially telling me that new nickel and manganese are ordering. Now I can go figure out what the structural refinements are. And if you're really, really careful, you look at the background and it's doing something strange as well. Now I know Kate has already given her talk on PDF. This is diffuse scattering. So even when we say it's not really ordered, it's starting to order. And we can do this with PDF. So essentially we plugged in the models and we said, okay, what does it locally look like? This one is an ordered sample and uh, this one is not an ordered sample. See, these, there are two additional reflections here which you don't see here in the Bragg, which is the long range, right? But in short range, they all look about the same and if you try to fit it with the disordered model, it doesn't fit very well. 
So within a, the unit lattice, it is ordering, which generally means it has an anti-phase boundary. So at the boundary of the lattice, it's kind of flipping. But in the long range, it still looks like it's ordered, uh, disordered, but in the short range, it's ordered. So all sorts of games you can play, so you know, we can come up with the conclusion that it, you know, what it's doing, and we in fact published this result because it was very interesting because this can drive the properties of your electrochemistry, wh what the sample is doing. I said we can do magnetism, right? Neutrons magnetic moment. So neutrons have spin, can be formed. Uh, you can use even polarized beam, right? Now, this is a field that I am not an expert at. So I borrowed some slides from my colleague, um, who, uh, Ovi Garlea, who does a lot of magnetism. So this is complicated stuff, right? It can have, these are the things that I worked on when I was in uh, postdoc, but there you can get triangular lattices, you can get canted, you can get spirals, and there are now techniques that you can use to solve these magnetic, complex magnetic structure, which tells you about the magnetic properties of these materials. So for example, here is one that Ovi gave me. It has, uh, this is a monoclinic uh, structure, it has a Jan-Teller distortion in the manganese oxygen, and has a ferroorbital ordering for this, and you can look at it by changing the temperature. So at room temperature, it may be paramagnetic, and then it converts, so you see all sorts of additional reflections coming up, and based on the tools that are available to us, we can actually then go solve the magnetic structure and draw spins like that, okay? This is only possible with neutron diffraction. As I said, most of the time, life gets complicated. This is why I have a partner proposal, because frequently what we do is we look at both x-rays and neutrons because they have different contrasts. So x-rays and neutrons are complementary techniques. So we encourage people to do both. So let's see. Here is a problem, again, a battery problem, because that's sort of what I work on. This is what, the, if you didn't have the manganese and the nickel, so lithium cobalt oxide is what started this whole revolution in lithium ion battery. This was discovered that if you use that as a cathode and carbon as an anode, you can actually cycle this thing very nicely. And this is probably what's in all of your cell phones and computers because this is essentially technologies from the 1980s. And this revolutionized the mobile technology, because you could now carry out a battery. And yet, we are all upset it does not last long enough, okay? So when we started out, Brian <laughs> and I, we did not have as much memory in our computer as you have on your little iPhone these days, okay? So of course, we want better batteries, and people are working. Not only do we want better batteries for our computers and our cell phones, we want to put batteries in our cars. Now, this is one of the problems, right? If it's not going to last that long, you're not going to be able to do a cross-country drive in your car if you all, of you, all you have is your batteries. So that's the push for the next generation. The things that we are working on is, can we make better batteries? And one of the things is, we like substitution of transition metal. These are sort of incremental improvements. So if you're aware of Tesla, which is going to, re uh, now has a, I think a $90,000 electric, car, but they are releasing a $30,000 electric car because they want to get into this market where cars are more affordable by people like us, okay? So what they're using is actually a nickel-rich manganese cobalt nickel. They all go in the same site. Turns out these th three things do three different things, so if you mix them in the right ratio, ratio they can improve the performance of your battery. Now, for crystallographers, however, they're sitting on the same site. How are we going to distinguish? Remember your basic algebra. If you have three unknowns, you need three equations to solve simultaneously. This is a very difficult problem. So it's something like that with neutrons, right? If I have three unknowns in one site, if I don't have the contrast, it's probably not going to give me 
you can kind of guess if you know more chemical knowledge, like if you started, if you made the material, you know the ratio of it, you can constrain to your refinement to have that ratio, that that's available. But often it helps if you have more than one radiation. So we do both X-ray and neutron. Now it's giving me more information and I can use that. Especially because if lithium is going into any of these sites, lithium and manganese, for us it's great, we have negative scattering, but both of them have negative scattering. Right, you can come up with a solution where it cancels out by putting in a positive scatterer, but it's not really there. However, because x-rays are not at all sensitive, well, a little sensitive to lithium, but manganese it knows that has a huge difference that will stop me from putting too much manganese in a site. So do that, you get x-rays and neutrons and do you refine and you can come up with some conclusions about the material. Okay, so in situ studies is another thing. I know I'm kind of rushing through a lot of examples, but the, the point here is not to go in uh, too much detail of the example, but to tell you, you can do all of these things with powder diffraction. The slides are with you. You can go back to the ones that interest you and your research, because I know there's a versatile research interest among you. So I'm covering my bases and telling you everything that one, I have done. There are plenty of other things I haven't. In situ studies is very important. So let's say I take a solid oxide fuel cell, which is another possibility. It's like a battery, except now it runs on fuel. The big problem with solid oxide fuel cell and using them in our day-to-day -day life is they're rather expensive because things don't move unless you heat them up, okay? So the lithium is nice, and this is why we're stuck with lithium batteries, because lithium is so light, even at room temperature, it's easy to make, make it move. When you have an oxygen ion, like a con the, in the SOFC, you have to heat it up to very high temperature. Now, if you have to heat it up at high temperature, that means all of your materials are now getting restricted. You can only use X, Y, Z things for your connectors, your, and it gets expensive. It can't compete with petroleum. Even lithium-ion batteries can't compete with petroleum, right? But this is one of the research areas in this field is, can we make ion conductors, people who synthesize materials, new materials, that operate at lower temperatures, right? The current technology is based on yttria-stabilized zirconia. That operates at 1,100 degrees. So most of the research is going into, can I bring it down to even six to 800 degrees? That's a huge saving in money. So, however, this one now, unlike the batteries, it, we are not applying a voltage. What we're doing is we're putting in oxygen on one side and either hydrogen or hydrocarbon on the other side. And that creates a chemical potential that allows you to have a full circuit. So if you wanted to study your electrodes, you would either have to be in an, in an oxygen atmosphere. If you wanted to do the anode, you'd have to be in a hydrogen atmosphere. So we built a system that allows you to study materials in different partial pressure of oxygen. So you can flow hydrogen, you can flow oxygen, and you can put the material in there. This is a furnace, there's an insert there. So essentially you put the powder in here, and then the, the gases come and gases go out. Not only do we have all of this set up, we also have an independent measurement of PO2, because that is the primary variable for SOFC folks. We put in a, um, oxygen sensor that tells you that information, measures it. We also have a mass spec. So instead of studying SOFC, if you were a catalyst person and you were studying catalysis, you need some of the similar conditions, right? You want to heat it up, you want to put some gas in it, but you also want to see what's coming out. So if you have a mass spec at the end, you know what's coming out. So we built this integrated system that allows us to do chemistry in the beam. And then, of course, you collect a whole bunch of data. You change, now you can change your PO2, not just temperature. So you can go to a certain temperature, change your PO2, collect diffraction patterns, and then analyze it to see what's going on in your material. So for example, here, this is a neodymium barium cobalt oxide, a perovskite, double perovskite structure. And because we, can, we are so sensitive to the oxygen, we can refine the oxygen occupancy. So we can say, here is where your uh, vacancies are. You need vacancies for things to move, right? 
not only can we say that the, the vacancies are really here, this is why they're moving this way, these things have an anisotropic thermal parameter even. So we're getting to sort of dynamics. I, I started out saying we primarily do statics, but you can infer that. You might want to do a spectroscopy experiment afterwards, but we can kind of say, because this is elongated this direction, it makes sense that the oxygens are moving in this path. Okay, so you can have a reaction mechanism based on this type of analysis. Okay, my last topic is ab initio structure solution. This is something I get a question on a lot of times. I don't know what my structure is. Can I solve the structure from powder? Most people solve structures from single crystal. It is the easiest way to solve structures. But sometimes you might not be able to grow a single crystal of the materials that you're interested in, okay? So in the last couple of decades, we have made huge progress in structure solution from powder diffraction. The better instrument that we build, the higher the resolution, you can actually distinguish your peaks, the overlaps, the problem, biggest problem. Why is it that powder is harder for this than single crystal? Because single crystal, you have a three-dimensional information. You know the HKL of your little spots. In a powder diffraction, what has happened? You get rings, right? You're integrating along the rings, which means you have lost that 3D information. You're working with a one-dimensional pattern. Now, because you have collapsed that three dimension to one dimension, things are going to start overlapping with each other. So this is why we want to go to a synchrotron to get high resolution instrument or uh, data or, or a neutron source where you can get these high resolution data so that you can distinguish the peaks. Then you have to be able to extract the intensity. Now, unequivocally extracting intensities from powder is difficult because you do not know what HKL they are, right? So there are all sorts of things that are available. So if you could, if you had a simple structure where you can really say, here are my peaks, here are my intensities, you can use some of the direct methods that single crystal folks use, right? Um, often it's not possible. So you can also see, if I've made a sample with something that I've changed one atoms, there might be an isostructural thing that somebody else has solved, right? I take manganese instead of nickel. First thing to check is, is the manganese structure the same as the nickel? If the, the, the data set sh sort of shows the same peaks in the same places, maybe you can just borrow that structure, change the nickel into manganese and see if it works. So that's one way. There are maximum entropy methods that you can use. There are uh, simulated annealing and Monte Carlo methods that you can use. In fact, that the example I'm going to show is this. This is primarily used for organic solids, right? If you have organic solids, you actually know a large amount of information about the conformation of your molecules, which helps. So you can use simulated annealing. The new thing that is, has made the inorganic chemists really, really happy is this business of charge flipping. Charge flipping actually works, and it's, it's, a, it's almost like a magic, it works, right? The only thing for those of you who are using charge flipping, if you use that for neutron data, one caveat, we have negative scattering lengths. That can actually mess you up. You have to handle those negative scattering lengths slightly differently, because x-rays don't have to worry about that. So the negative scattering lengths are manganese, titanium, vanadium, hydrogen. Have I missed, I think? Lithium, yes. So if there are five elements that if you have those, just be careful if you're trying to use charge flipping with neutrons. There is a way to do it. It's called band flipping, and in fact, one of my colleagues worked with somebody to work that out. You also have genetic algorithm, and I have no, not enough time to go through all of them. So what I'm going to do is show you an example where, we, where my supervisor, now this is not my work, used it to solve a structure that was of importance because it has to do with malaria. Some of you might know this is a disease that's coming back and the problem is that quinine, which is the medication for this, is not working for, for some of the resistant variations because most people don't use quinine, they use a, something called chloroquinine, which is a little bit cheaper drug, for, especially for the third world countries, and there are resistant variations of it. So 
the, the, what happens in this cycle of malaria, it's a complicated cycle. Those of you who are more biologists know more about this than I do. But the thing of importance for us is when it infects the blood cells, uh, it digests the hemoglobin, but it has to separate out the iron-containing part. If it can't, because this thing is poisonous for this, these uh, things called, I guess, tropozoids, okay? It's toxic. So they have a mechanism to break the red blood cells into two pieces. Uh, it's your hemo uh, it's a globular part. So when somebody dies or uh, if you can take an infected tissue out, you see these crystalline things, the separated iron porphyrin. So the idea behind the work was if you can come up with a drug that stops you from separating those two out, that's a possible way to kill malaria, right? So this is sort of the broad thing. So this came along uh, in our lab, and essentially the idea was, okay, if you look at the infected cell, this is what the red cell looks like, and this is what an infected cell looks like. So you have this crystalline stuff. Now this data, unfortunately, is not good enough to do a structure solution from, right? The natural thing that, so the first challenge for the scientist who's working on it is, can you make this stuff synthetically, right? So there was the, co the collaborators that we had actually made it synthetically and showed, yes, this is synthetic and this is actually, you know, what comes out of. So one, we've succeeded in doing that. So to do the structure solution, here are the steps. So what do we know? Given atom position, it is straightforward to compute what the intensities are. You've heard in the earlier lectures, the biggest problem we have is the phase problem, right? The reverse is not as easy. This is easy. This is why we felt refinement works. You take a model, you calculate, you check your model versus what you've collected, and you refine the difference, right? If you had intensities, the reverse is not that easy. So to solve a structure, you first have to get a very good data set. For I'm now talking only about powder. I'm not talking about single crystal. There are differences in here. So you have to get very high quality data and first find the lattice. Most of our projects of solving structures end there because you can't index it. So you have to index it. And there are softwares that are much, much better than there used to be. So if you're familiar with a program called Topaz, that, that has a very nice indexing program. Unfortunately, it's not free. You do have to buy this. You can buy the academic version. A similar thing, the indexing program, uh, I think GSAS2 uses the same algorithm for indexing. So GSAS2 is free. So first you index, and then you look at what are the reflections that are missing. So if you index it to a cubic, the next step is you, we have 230 space groups, right? We have to assign a space group to it. And you look at the missing reflections and try to figure out what that space group is. So space group, internal symmetries and systematic absences, density, gas, lock, call it whatever you want. These are the tricks that we use. So you know, my supervisor is like a pro at this. He used to come up with, oh, this must be this. And I'm, I used to go, how do you know this? Well, and then you know, this 10 years of experience doing it is actually quite important in some of this. Nonetheless, once, if you've gone to this point, now you have to extract the intensities and then solve the structure. So the way we did this um, was because of the fact that we have organic stuff, you can build the molecule, the organic chemists actually know really well. Not always true for inorganics because, you know, now we don't have mo molecules, right? It's a different problem. But you can find constraints. You can know what the part of the molecule is rigid versus what can move. Okay, so you see this porphyrin ring is going to be rigid. It, it's not very likely that that's going to move. However, these things that are sticking out from it are floppy, right? So you have to be able to do a torsion on these. So you build a model based on this molecule and you run a Monte Carlo. You just look for solution. We have very, very good computers these days. This is not that hard. So if, if you're successful, 
You get some solutions and you look at these solutions and you do a read felt refinement at that point. And here is a solution, okay? So they, were, they managed to actually solve this structure from that data. And the, the traditional thinking was these things polymerize. What they found, which is why it was published in Nature, that this is not a polymer, it's a dimer. Okay, so if you solve the structure, you can actually draw how the dimers are formed. So I think I'm going to skip that. So the last bastion, of course, is proteins. It's really, really complicated, but that does not stop people from trying. This was actually done way, way back when, when I was a graduate student by Bob Von Driel. And this was early days of trying to do protein, protein crystallography with synchrotrons. Half of the time, his sample was burning out. So he looked at the, the radiation damage on his proteins afterwards, right? So this, this was very old, and things have improved significantly. Uh, but they were a lot, you know, everybody, Apparently, if you're a protein guy, you know this, you start with something simple, and this is one uh, w which was sort of known, so they ground it up, they found the solution, and they published this. There's more work going on in this field, and if you're interested, I really don't know a whole lot about it, but if you're in interested, this is, uh, this is a group in uh, France, and ESRF, who has been looking at some of these things, and they've come up with the, the how you build this model and how you actually deal with powder data and protein crystallography. So I know it has been a very fast train going through a lot of examples, but the take home message here is powder diffraction is an extremely powerful technique to study structural properties of a wide variety of materials. If nothing else, I hope I've given you a wide variety of things that you can do. And if you can not build those make those single crystals, which is not always possible. We are here to help with structure analysis. And with that, I will take questions. Uh, and I've given you some basics uh, information that you can look up yourself. 